Some people believe Henry Ford invented the first car. Others believe that he invented the assembly line, but he didn't. So why is he so famous? Well, Henry Ford had this idea that everyone in America should be able to afford a car. To make this a reality, he revolutionized the car manufacturing process. The innovations he made didn't just change the car making business, but also helped America's 20th century middle class take off. Join us on a ride through Ford's history. It's 1875, Michigan, USA. Young Henry Ford is just 12 years old when he experiences two events that will majorly impact his life. His father gives him a watch and he sees the operation of a Nichols and Shepard steam engine tractor on a country road. Henry has grown up on a farm in Greenfield, Michigan. This is the first vehicle other than horse drawn he has ever seen. The next year, he successfully repairs a friend's watch. Taking it apart, he extracts a sliver from its working. He quickly gains a reputation as a watch repairman amongst neighbors and friends. He hates farming, but he loves machines. Three years later, he leaves the farm to work as an apprentice machinist in Detroit, but returns in 1882. He does little farming. Instead, he operates and services engines used by farmers. He thinks farm animals consume far too much hay and oats and believes farming should become more mechanized to make it easier for farmers. He attempts to make a farm tractor before he gets into making cars. During this time, he marries the daughter of a neighboring farmer, Clara Bryant. She will become an active suffrage fighting for the rights of women to vote. In 1891, they moved to Detroit, where Henry, without any formal studies, gets a job as a mechanical engineer with the Edison Illuminating Company. In his home workshop, he continues to build engines. Fast forward to 1896. Henry is now 32 years old. He has become chief engineer at the Edison Illuminating Company. He also completes his first automobile, which he calls the Quadricycle because it runs on four bicycle tires. It's powered by a two-cylinder ethanol engine that produces four horsepower. It has only two forward speeds with no reverse gear. After various test drives, it records a top speed of 20 miles an hour. He sells it for 200 bucks and goes on to build another two. Now he has come up with the idea of a low-priced car for ordinary Americans. Most people think cars are only for the rich, but not Henry Ford. He attends a convention of the Association of Edison Illuminating Companies at the Oriental Hotel on Manhattan Beach in Brooklyn. There he is introduced to Thomas Alva Edison, who sees his plans for a gasoline automobile and encourages him to continue. Let's pause here. This is Thomas Edison. He has often been described as America's greatest inventor. The same guy who gave us the light bulb. And it wasn't just the light bulb. He also invented the phonograph and the motion picture camera. Well, he didn't actually invent the motion picture camera. He bought the rights from a Frenchman, but that's another story. Ever thought about where the phrase light bulb moment comes from? Yes, Thomas Edison. The funny thing is, we often think inventors sit alone when that light bulb moment suddenly happens. But Edison was, in fact, one of the first inventors to apply teamwork to invention. So he applied principles of process, which allowed inventors to work together. We'll see later in the story how he and Henry worked together to produce an affordable electric vehicle. We know now they weren't successful at the time, which makes us wonder why. But let's continue on Ford's journey. After meeting Edison, Henry shows him his designs for an internal combustion engine. Edison encourages Henry to carry on, even though he believes the future is in electric cars. Turns out he was right. He was just ahead of his time by a hundred years or so. It's now 1899. Ford leaves the Edison Illuminating Company to start his own company, the Detroit Motor Company. The following year, he releases his first vehicle, a gasoline powered delivery truck. It gets great reviews, but is unreliable and slow. In an effort to get sales, the company creates a catalog that compares the cost of running the vehicle to the cost of a horse and carriage. Despite the effort, the company fails, but Ford tries again with the Henry Ford Company. By now, he has built a 26-horsepower race car. 
He competes in a 10 lap race at the one mile overall of the Detroit Driving Club and beats Alexander Winton, the top race car driver of the era, who is driving a 70 horsepower racer. He uses the money he wins at the race to fund this new company. But it fails too because investors feel he's spending too much time on auto racing. So he leaves the company with the rights to his name and 900 bucks. But he leaves behind the plans for the commercial car he's been working on. Henry Leland, who's working at the Henry Ford Company, thinks the plans will work. He successfully convinces the investors to continue with the business and launch the car. They changed the name of the company to Cadillac, named after the French explorer, who founded Detroit in 1701. Ford, in the meantime, finds some more investors to start a third company. Two of his investors are the brothers John and Horace Dodge, who will later start their own car company. You can guess what that is. Will the third time be lucky for Ford? The name of the new company says it all, the Ford Motor Company. Ford is not present at the beginning because his investors have concerns that he might leave the company. Who can blame them with his track record? But now we'll see how this changes. Ford Motor Company launches in 1903 and the same year the Ford Model A is released. It's practically identical to the model that Cadillac launched a few months prior. This is hardly surprising since they use Henry's designs. This begins a lifelong grudge Henry will hold against Henry Leland. Much later in the story, we will see how he gets his revenge. But first, let's pause for a moment. Why was Detroit home to so many giants in the motor industry? In the space of just a few years, we got all these car makers starting up in Detroit. There's Ford, Cadillac, Dodge, and Lincoln, which Henry Leland went on to start a few years later. Why does Motor City or Motown, as Detroit becomes known, become the global center of the automotive industry? A key reason is location. It's along the Great Lakes Waterway, a major port and transportation hub. So this is how it happens. You get one motor company setting up their business there. They train and attract workers. Now motor company number two has set up shop. Detroit isn't the only transportation hub in the country, of course, but they've also got a skilled workforce. So motor company number two pulls in. Now you got even more skilled workers and the cycle continues. Before long, you've got a whole lot of motor companies across the road from each other. The same thing happened at Silicon Valley in the 1990s as it turned into a global hub for technology. But let's get back to our story. The Ford Motor Company is taking off. 1,750 Model A cars are made through 1903 to 1904. That's a few cars a day. Two or three men work on each car. More models are released and more are sold each year. Then in 1908, the Model T is released. By 1908, there are only 18,000 miles of paved road in the United States. So Henry uses light and strong vanadium steel alloy to build the critical parts of the vehicle. His cars will not be frivolous fun cars for the rich, but real hard working, reliable cars for the mass market. It's a huge success. In its first year, over 10,000 models are produced, and a few years later, the number rises to 170,211. Before the model is retired in 1927, 15 million would be sold, making it one of the best-selling vehicles of all time. It is considered by most to be the most important car ever made. But that still isn't enough for Henry. He's looking for ways to make cars more affordable. It's now 1913, and things start accelerating. Henry introduces the world's first moving auto assembly line. He reduces the time to assemble a car from 12 and a half hours to 2 hours and 40 minutes, and eventually 1 hour and 33 minutes. This means by 1920 they're producing 1 million cars a year. The moving assembly line is critical to Henry, achieving his goal of bringing cars to ordinary Americans. So how did this moving assembly line come about? Let's rewind a few years to understand the steps that led up to this incredible innovation. Car making starts in the late 19th century. Each vehicle is individually hand built. Very few parts are interchangeable with any other vehicles. Very few parts are duplicated. Craftspeople building these vehicles need to be highly skilled. Then car makers start using interchangeable parts. Earlier versions of this are used in the Oldsmobile Curve Dash, another car maker in Detroit, in 1901. So now you have a whole lot of the same parts that fit a whole lot of cars. This makes cars easier and faster to make. The people who assemble these cars don't need the same degree of skill. 
Henry designs his cars to use interchangeable parts. He also aims for less interchangeable parts. This means less assembly time. He first tries setting up assembly stands. Usually only a few workers work at each stand and assemble the car. Then he tries having parts taken to the workers at the stands. Then he has workers moving along the stands. He trains each worker to do just one thing and then move on to the next stand. But walking between stands takes time and causes traffic jams. How can he make it easier and quicker? He introduces the world's first moving assembly line. He moves the cars to the assemblers. It's a simple system that pulls the cars along the factory floor. The vehicle's wheels are attached to metal strips which are attached to the moving belt. The idea comes from William Pa Clan, who brings it to Henry. Henry has sent his team searching for ideas. William gets it from visiting a slaughterhouse in Chicago, where carcasses are butchered as they move along a conveyor. One person removes the same piece over and over without moving from a spot. It changes the way cars are produced forever. It also changes how other things are manufactured too. It is because of that Henry Ford is often regarded as the father of mass production. The assembly line allows Henry to achieve his dream of making cars affordable for working families. In 1908, the price of a Model T is around 825 bucks. And by 1912, it is a drop of 590 bucks. By 1914, an assembly line worker can buy a Model T with four months pay. By 1925, it drops even further to around 260 bucks. The equivalent price today would be around 3,120 bucks, which is a pretty good deal, even though it didn't have air conditioning, Wi-Fi, power steering, and a lot more stuff. But there's one big problem with the assembly line. The cars are made faster than the paint dries. This creates a bottleneck in the production line. A moving assembly line works efficiently when everything keeps moving. One slow area will slow the whole assembly line down. There's only one paint that dries fast enough, and that paint is black. So what does Henry do? He only makes black cars. The company drops all the colors that have been available before 1914. It was only in 1926 that paint technology catches up with a fast-drying Dugo lacquer. Henry is quoted as saying, any customer can have a car painted any color that he wants so long as it is black. He only made black cars for a few years because it was the only way he could make cars that everyone could afford at the time. The assembly line is not the only thing Henry does in 1914, not by a long shot. Let's reverse just a bit to January the 7th. The newspaper headline says it all. Gold rush is started by Ford's $5 offer. Henry stuns the world by introducing the $5 day. He basically doubles his workers' pay overnight. But why? We know he said he wanted his workers to be able to afford the cars that they made. What better way than making cars affordable and paying his workers more? This is part of the reason, but it's not the whole story. Henry is a clever businessman and he's driven by the idea of efficiency. By 1914, employee turnover is high at Ford and this isn't efficient. Every time someone leaves, it means training someone new. Henry wants to make workers stay at the company, so he pays them more. Not only more, but double what they can earn anywhere else. Who wouldn't stay at a company that doubles your salary overnight? I know I would. It's not just the workers' pay that doubles. Over the next two years, profits double at the company too. This was because the workers are so motivated that they become highly efficient. It has other consequences too. Competitors are forced to raise wages to avoid losing their best worker. This means that soon everybody is earning more. This means they're all buying more too, so the economy becomes stronger. It's a win-win for everyone. But he has another side too. He also introduces a profit share for people who work at Ford for more than six months. But this comes with some questionable strings attached. In order to qualify, they have to conduct their lives according to Ford standards. The rules include no heavy drinking, gambling, or deadbeat dads, as they are referred to back then. This is highly controversial. Nobody wants the company they work for to tell them how to live their lives. Even Henry realizes he's gone too far. He also gives workers a shorter week. Workers have been working six days with nine hour days. Ford reduces the working week to five and a half days with eight hour days. This isn't just to make workers happy. It's also based on efficiency. 
You can only fit two nine-hour shifts into 24 hours. This means the factory stands idle for six hours. But if you reduce the shifts to eight hours, well, then you can fit three shifts into a 24-hour day. This means your factories work solidly for 24 hours and that's more efficient. Henry always wanted to make life easier for workers. The assembly line kept them safer. They stayed in one spot instead of moving around. This drastically reduced the rate of injury. The combination of high wages and high efficiency, including the assembly line, is copied by many companies across the United States. It makes workers more money and makes companies more productive. Everyone follows his lead in order for their business to survive. This results in an increase in efficiency in many companies, not just Ford. This way of working will eventually be used in shipbuilding and aircraft production. This will satisfy the demands of World War II. Afterwards, William S. Knudsen, who worked at Ford, GM, and the National Defense Advisory Commission says, We won because we smothered the enemy in an avalanche of production, the like of which had never been seen nor dreamed possible. 1914 is a busy year for Henry Ford. His assembly line is rolling and his company is making hundreds of thousands of cars a year. He buys his wife Clara an electric car. It's a 1914 Detroit Electric, which she prefers to the Model T. It runs 80 miles on a single charge and reaches a top speed of 20 miles an hour. Word spreads that Henry is looking at manufacturing an electric vehicle. The New York Times reports he's building experimental electric cars. Other rumors report that he's bought an electricity generating plant in Niagara Falls, my hometown, specifically for the production of the Edison Ford car. Henry confirms these rumors, saying that he and Thomas Edison, you remember him, the guy who invented the light bulb, have been working on an electric car that will be practical and affordable. The problem is building a lightweight battery that can operate for long distances without recharging. Edison tells Automobile Topics that the Edison Ford car is coming along. It will sell between $500 and $750. Edison believes eventually the electric car will be universally used everywhere. Well, it turns out he's right. It just takes a lot longer than he expected. In fact, at the turn of the century, there are more electric cars and gas cars on the road in the United States. 40% of the cars are powered by steam, 38% by electricity, and only 22% by gasoline. Electric vehicles are better than gas-powered cars in many ways. They don't vibrate or smell, and they don't make noise. They also don't need a hand crank to start the engine. But electric cars are much more expensive than gas cars. By 1912, Edison has built three cars. He drives one from Scotland to London. He achieves top speeds of 25 miles an hour with two 15-volt batteries and a 30-volt electric motor but his car is twice as expensive as a gasoline car. This is where Henry comes in. He made gas-powered cars affordable. Can he do the same with electric cars? We'll never know because by 1914, the project falls apart. Some say it's because Henry insists on powering the car with Edison's nickel-iron batteries, which are not suitable. There are rumors that the oil cartels are involved. These rumors are fueled further when Edison's workshop in West Orange is destroyed by a fire. The only outcome from the Edison Ford project seems to be his electric starter and electric lighting systems which are added to the Model T in 1919. Let's fast forward for a moment to 2020. This is a year Ford is planning to have 10 to 25 percent of their fleet electric. It takes over 100 years for Henry and Edison's vision of a mainstream electric vehicle to materialize. Now back to 1917. America enters World War I. Henry is a pacifist. He even went on a peace mission to Europe two years prior to protest the war. Now he has commandeered to assist with production of vehicles. Ford develops the three-ton M 1918 Ford tank. The contract is to produce 10,000 of these lighter, cheaper tanks. They initially build 15 and one is sent to France for testing. It is found to be inferior to the Renault FT, so the order is canceled. One wonders how disappointed Henry is with all this. He likes things to work, but he disapproves of the war. With Henry, you never know. After all, a year later, he tricks the shareholders into selling their shares in the Ford Motor Company. It is 1918. He makes his son Edsel president. Then he starts a new company called Henry Ford and Son. 
He makes a big show of taking himself and his top people to the new company. He offers to buy back the shareholders' shares in Ford and Company. The shareholders agree because they think their shares will decrease with Henry gone. Once they do, they realize they've been tricked. He never had any plans to start a new company. He just wants complete control over the Ford Motor Company. Even his son, who is now president, doesn't get to make decisions. Henry overturns those decisions he disagrees with. Now it's 1922. Henry gets revenge on Henry Leland for using his designs all those years ago. The war has not been kind to Leland and Lincoln has gone bankrupt. Henry purchases Lincoln and he has Leland and his son escorted out of the building. It's not just revenge. Ford needs a separate luxury division. Edsel's keen to develop cars more exciting than Model T and pushes his father into making cars that aren't just practical. Edsel is responsible for Lincoln Zephyr and Lincoln Continental. He introduces important features such as hydraulic brakes. But by 1927, sales are dwindling. Other car manufacturers are eating into the Model T sales, especially Chevy, who's going after the Model T market. The Chevy-Ford rivalry begins. Chevy, now part of General Motors, overtakes Ford in sales. Henry realizes that Edsel is right. A new design is necessary. And he shuts down the factory to tool up for the new model. It's 1927 and Ford releases the Model A. It's styled by Edsel and is beautiful and fashionable. It's the first car with safety glass in the windshield. Ford retakes the lead. Two years later, Chevy introduces a six-cylinder model. They promote the six-cylinder model for the same price you'd pay for a four. It's priced at $555 to $675. The Model A Ford costs from $385 to $550. The large and more powerful Chevy cars preferred by customers. Henry thinks it's all over for four-cylinder cars. He closes 25 of his 36 plants and lays off 75,000 men. But he has a trick up his sleeve. He's been experimenting with eight cylinders. He tries an X8 configuration, but without success. It's too heavy and fails repeatedly. Now he's secretly working on something else. One year later, he launches the first low-priced car with a V8 engine. Once again, he brings innovation to the ordinary people. The breakthrough occurs because he develops a single block mold engine. Up until now, V8 engines have been made with multiple parts. The V8 flathead makes it affordable. It isn't just ordinary people who can go faster. The car is also a favorite amongst American gangsters. In 1934, Ford receives a letter from, or supposedly from, Clyde Barrow endorsing the Ford V8. Clyde Barrow of the notorious Bonnie and Clyde gang. The next few years, Ford is badly not only the competition, but also the unions. Henry doesn't believe in unions. Edsel attempts to reason with them. Eventually, his wife, Clara, threatens to leave him if he doesn't sign with the unions. He signs and gives workers better terms than both GM and Chrysler. Now it's 1941. It seems that America will enter World War II. The government asks Ford to produce parts for the B-24 Liberator military aircraft. Ford goes back to the government with a counterproposal. They will build complete airplanes. In March, construction starts on the Willow Run plant in Michigan. By September, they begin partial production. Next to the plant, they construct an airport with six runways and three aircraft hangars. The plant is formally dedicated on October 22, 1941. Forty-five days later, Pearl Harbor is bombed. America enters the war. Edsel sets a goal of producing one plane every hour. They achieve that goal. Edsel doesn't live to see the end of the war. He dies from stomach cancer in 1943 at just 49 years old. His son, Henry Ford II, is serving in the Navy and cannot take over the presidency of the Ford Motor Company. So Henry reassumes the presidency. But he's aging, inconsistent, and suspicious, and no longer fit for the task. The company begins to decline. President Franklin Roosevelt considers a government takeover to protect the wartime production. But this doesn't happen. Henry Ford II leaves the Navy and joins the company management a few weeks later but his grandfather won't give him control. Eventually, Henry's wife, Clara, puts pressure on him to let go. Sounds like my wife. And Edsel's widow threatens to sell her shares unless her son is given control. Finally, two years and 19 days after the war ends, Henry Ford steps down. Henry II will have the task of turning the ailing company around. 12 months later, Henry Ford passes away. 
By this time, the company he founded has produced more than 31 million vehicles. Ford releases a car simply called Ford. It's the first all-new automobile introduced by any of the big three car companies after World War II. It's credited with saving Ford and bringing a new streamlined car. Fast forward to 1955. Bill Haley has Americans rocking around the clock. Drivers want something fun and sporty. Chevy's Corvette has been on the streets for a few years. Ford releases the Thunderbird. It's two-seat convertible with a V8 engine. It's not marketed as a sports car. It starts its own market segment, the personal luxury car. Henry II's greatest dream is to overtake the family's decade-long rival, General Motors. General Motors' main market is in medium-priced cars. Ford released the Edsel to compete in this market. Ford invests heavily in this car. They run a year-long teaser campaign. They say that Edsel will be the car of the future, but it's overhyped. When it launches, the Edsel is considered unattractive and overpriced. It's one of Ford's biggest failures. But strangely enough today, people are now starting to collect them. Ford recovers with the Mustang. Once again, Ford creates an entirely new class of cars. This is the Pony class, affordable, sporty cars. Chevy follows with the Camaro and Pontiac brings out the Firebird. The Mustang is also credited for inspiring the design of Toyota's Celica. It's 1966. Henry II decides it's time to break away from the old logo design. He hires the famous Paul Rand who comes up with a radical new design. You've probably never seen it. That's because Henry II wisely decided to stick with the original Ford logo. The original logo was developed by Child Wills. He used his grandfather's stencil set, which was based on the style of writing taught when he and Henry Ford were at school. The blue oval made its appearance a little later in the 1927 Model A car. Now it's 1973 and the oil crisis hits. The increase in fuel prices results in some big changes in the American market. People can't afford to drive big cars. They need smaller cars that are more fuel efficient. Imports from Japan begin to flood the market. If you watched our video on how Toyota got so big, you'll have seen that the Japanese car makers faced the same problem back in Japan in the 1930s. They couldn't compete with Ford and General Motors, who had set up manufacturing companies there. Now the wheel is turned, and it's American cars that can't compete. But one thing history teaches us is that things change and then change again. Henry II doesn't like small cars, but he approves the development of the Pinto. He brashly predicts in 1978 that Ford will drive imports back into the sea. Well, he was wrong on that one. <laughs> this does not happen, of course, but Pinto is a winner. The word Pinto is Spanish for spotted. It's not a breed, but used to describe a horse that has large patches of white or any other color. Now you're thinking, what's with all the horses? Did someone at Ford really like horses? First Mustang, then Pinto, and not forgetting Bronco. Well, it turns out the Mustang was named after World War II P-51 Mustang fighter plane. Of course, the fighter plane was named after the wild Mustang horse. Bronco is the word American cowboys used to describe an untrained horse. Ford brought out the Bronco in 1966, two years after the Mustang. Then there was the Pinto, which was marketed as a little carefree car. And much later, there was the Ford Ranger. It isn't just Ford. Dodge bought out the Colt in 1971. They also produced a Charger. Mitsubishi has Kuda, which means horse in Indonesian. There's the Brumby from Subaru. Hyundai has Equus, which means horse in Latin. And an earlier model called Pony. Even Rolls-Royce has one. The Camargue is a breed of horse in the south of France. So what is with all the horse names? Well, the obvious reason is that horses replace cars in transportation. So there was historic and nostalgic connection. But horses are also powerful and beautiful and move fast. So car makers use horse names to suggest their car has the same characteristics. Then of course, horses represent freedom. So do cars. When Henry Ford made cars available to the ordinary man, he gave him the freedom to drive wherever he wanted. So long as he stuck to the road, of course. Back to Ford's story. Ford reports profits of $3.3 billion compared to GM's $2.95 billion. 
It's the first time since 1924 that Ford has beaten GM on the bottom line. Henry Ford II has the satisfaction of beating GM, even if only in a financial sense. A few years on, the economy is booming. Fuel prices are low. Ford acquires Jaguar cars and Aston Martin. Things begin to change at the beginning of the 21st century. The road becomes very bumpy for Ford. Bill Ford, the great-grandson of Henry Ford, becomes president. He's the first Ford to head the company since his uncle Henry Ford II retired in 1982. He must drive the company through a challenging landscape. Fuel prices have risen. Ford sales are declining. Stocks are falling. It'll take some huge changes to bring the company back to profitability. Ford unveils a plan called The Way Forward. It covers resizing the company, dropping unprofitable models. 14 factories close and 30,000 jobs are cut. They're also looking at hybrid technologies. Ford team up with Southern California Edison to examine the plug-in hybrids. Let's pause for a moment. Now, this is not Edison's company, even though it has his name. Thomas Edison allowed electric utility companies to use his patents as long as they also used his name. But there's a connection, and now you've got these two names working together. It's been a long road to electric cars for Ford. Started at the beginning of the 20th century with Henry and Edison working on electric technology. It's also at the very end of the century that Ford releases EV vehicles, the Ford Ranger and then later the Ford Focus Electric. While we're talking about technology, let's take a look at the evolution of the assembly line. The speed at which they can now make a car would have made Henry Ford a very happy man. It's now 1980 and robots are installed. The Fiesta is one of the first cars in the world where a robot injects its anti-corrosion sealant. By the early 21st century, hundreds of robots are fastening things together. By 2012, the robots get eyes, well, not actual eyes, but they can detect positions of objects. Then robots get cup hands to install windshields and fenders on the Ford Escape. By 2010, high-tech dirt detection systems replaced the human eye when it came to fine imperfections. Modular assemblies are introduced to cater for increased vehicle options. Looking forward, 3D will probably play a huge role in the auto industry manufacturing. By 1913, the first moving assembly line enables Ford to produce a chassis in 1 hour 33 minutes. By 2013, 100 years later, Ford is making an entire car in 86 seconds. Now it's 2008 and the financial crisis hits America. Ford sells Jaguar and Land Rover to Tata Motors for $2.3 billion. Four years later, things improve a bit. They buy majority share in Argo AI, a self-driving car startup. Jim Hackett becomes CEO. He's been running the Ford Smart Mobility Program, a unit responsible for experimenting with car sharing programs, self-driving ventures, and other programs. Fast forward to 2018, and there's a shocking announcement. Ford will discontinue passenger cars in the North American market for the next four years except for the Mustang and a new vehicle. This new vehicle is the Ford Fusion. It comes in gas, hybrid, and plug-in powertrain options. It has a lot of smart technology, including the Ford Pass Connect, which allows the car to go online as a hotspot. 90% of Ford's North American portfolio will be trucks, utilities, and commercial vehicles. It's been an eventful drive through the history of the car company that changed the world. Henry Ford left a legacy that shaped our society in so many ways. He introduced processes that changed not only the auto industry, but reached all manufacturing industries around the whole world. But most importantly, he achieved this vision of making cars available for every average American family. If you like this episode, please support us by sharing the video.